like to welcome and thank all of you for coming to what is really a trial balloon of sorts. It's a, it's a new concept that we're trying at the Institute. It's really going to hopefully morph into a half day seminar that we can offer out on the road in America. And uh, very much appreciate your being here uh, as we try this and uh, welcome and good morning to our online audience. In many ways, uh, those of you here in this room and, and, and many of you online are not the target audience ultimately for this boot camp concept because you already come to the Mises Institute with a lot of knowledge and understanding of Austrian economics, a lot of background. But I think even for someone who's fairly well versed, uh, boot camp might help you identify some of your blind spots. Um, a lot of us have read different authors. We've read some Hayek, we've read some Mises, we've read some Rothbard, but we don't necessarily know how everything fits together. So the concept behind boot camp was very simple, and it's something that some of our donors have been pressing us for for years. They said, you know, let's create a course where we take the entire universe of economics, as huge as that may be, and sort of distill it into about six silos. And if you take those six silos, they're necessarily superficial because of the time constraints, but they're very broad. And so you can really take almost everything about economics and compress it into a course and give someone a a really basic understanding. And what we would hope to do would be able to just take an intelligent layperson off the street, a person who's perhaps never had economics in high school or college, who's not inclined to spend their free time reading a 900 page human action, who's not going to, as let's say as an adult, go sign up for a community college class that meets every Thursday night at seven o'clock and that's kind of difficult. You know, the concept is just say, hey, give us a half a day of your life. And if you just do that, we certainly hope to spur a further and greater interest in studying economics beyond that. But if you just do that, a half day with us, you will know more about economics than 95% of your fellow laypersons. And if we can do that, you know, we can help intelligent people have a, a framework to analyze the economic issues of the day, the political promises we're all going to be inundated with for the next 16 months. So that's the concept behind boot camp. Um, we hope you enjoy it, and we hope to roll it out in some cities going forward. And uh, the syllabus alone, I think, could benefit uh, the average person. If you just read the syllabus, you would, have, you would begin to have an understanding of, at least from an Austrian perspective, how we see this vast universe we call economics. And really, a lot of the yeoman's work behind this was the, the mind and the experience and knowledge of David Gordon, who was able to take uh, a lot of broad and, and tough concepts and distill them down for us. So we're going to have six different teachers today, and we're starting with Bob Murphy. So thanks so much for coming, and a round of applause for Bob. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. We recognize that the average person doesn't think when he wakes up on a Saturday morning, I wonder, what should I do? I know, I'll go listen to economics lectures for a while. So we appreciate that. Uh, also, I just want to underscore what Jeff is saying. We, we are all big fans of the Austrian School of Economics and of Ludwig von Mises in particular. And we do agree with what Jeff said there, that if you take this, this boot camp, you will know more, than, more economics than 95% of your neighbors and about 93% of professional economists. So, <laughs> well, so part of what we're doing here is we want to explain to you why do we like the Austrians so much. So I want to just give you some uh, guidance here. Make sure as, as these lectures go on that you're following along with your, your packet. We're going to try to follow that syllabus pretty closely. And so you'll see an outline of where the lectures are headed. And then we're gonna aim to do like a 30 minute or so chunk of lecture and then leave time at the end for Q&A because we know that if, if you have questions that that's probably sometimes where the most learning occurs. So uh, let me just first sort of give a big picture in terms of this, this odd term action and praxeology and then and why does Mises title his famous treatise Human Action? Let me try to give you a little background about that. So what the, uh, the there was a revolution in economics and it, it formally occurred during the 1870s. Of course, it had been germinating earlier than that. And it was the founder of the Austrian school, Karl Menger, who was as widely recognized among all economists as one of the three pioneers. It, it was called the, the marginal revolution where the old classical approach, people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, the way they would explain market prices, they would look at the cost of production. And then this new so-called marginal revolution instead explained 
prices in terms of the consumer and the subjective valuation. So I think in the next few lectures, you're going to get more of that. I don't want to take too much time there. But what I want to explain is Mises says in human action that once that revolution occurred, the economics per se was no longer a self-contained discipline. It wasn't that all the things we want to talk about in economics uh, could just be contained there, that the new methods and tools that were unleashed or uh, you know, unraveled, if you will, during the so-called subjective revolution that really occurred in the 1870s, that once that happened, it was no longer just applying those tools to narrowly economic things like the price of wheat or wage rates or the business cycle that Mises said this opened up a whole new field of the study of action per se. Okay, so again, that's one of the reasons that Mises' book, his famous book is called Human Action, not you know, you know principles of economics or something like that that you might have otherwise expected because he was realizing economics is just a subset of this broader field of praxeology is the term Mises used. So where that term comes from, what that means, praxeology, it's a sort of intimidating term, but it just means like the, the study of action or the logic of action per se, all right? So it's, it's economics is just a, a subset, a part of the broader praxeology. Uh, if you want to get an idea to, to remind yourself of where does that term come from, I was just curious to see what it would say. I, I went and just Googled, uh, you know, Greek word praxis definition to see, and it's, it, it'll pop up and it'll say it's practice as distinguished from theory. Okay, so that word praxis, you know, one of the, the roots there, one of the possible English translations of what that means is practice is distinguished from theory, right? So in conventional everyday usage, people often say, oh yeah, that's true in theory, but what about in practice, All right? So I really like that because it underscores what the Austrians in the tradition of Ludwig von Mises are doing. Just so let me just be clear about this. We are not building hypothetical models where things happen and then we hope that that sheds some light on the real world. What, starting with Karl Menger and continuing with you know, his, his followers in the tradition of the, what we call the Austrian school, what they're trying to do is explain how do people in the real world act. And so in particular, if we wanna know where do market prices come from, what causes the business cycle, where, why is there long-term institutional unemployment, all of these things about the real world, we wanna know really what's happening, okay? Whereas in other schools of thought, they build hypothetical little models and they make a bunch of assumptions and they draw conclusions and study that little simulated reality. And then they hope maybe that's close enough or that will shed some insight into the real world. But that's not what the Austrians do. So I want to be clear about that. Uh, another uh, dis distinguishing feature, another way to, to clarify what it is that the Austrians are doing is that we are not studying, you might have heard the term homo economicus or economic man. And that was something that was developed, again, in the classical period. And then even to this day, many economists and other schools use this framework where they're saying, well, let's assume people are really selfish or let's assume people really just care about money and study that aspect of their behavior. And that's what economics does. But then there's all kinds of other stuff like philanthropy and, and things over here or like a mother caring for her child. And that's outside the scope. of That is not at all what the Austrians do. Mises is saying we are in praxeology, we study action per se. And then, yes, if somebody happens to be very selfish and cares about money, then that falls under the umbrella of what we're studying. But Mother Teresa also falls under the umbrella of what we're studying. So what do I mean when I keep using this term action? It means purposeful behavior. All right. So it means people who are choosing action or, or who are behaving in a certain way in order to achieve a goal that the people have, okay? And that's really what action means. So it's distinguished from reflexive behavior. And don't be intimidated by this. This is very straightforward. So if we do it all the time in everyday life. You do it so automatically, you don't even realize it. But just, to, let me just give you an example to make sure you, you see the distinction. If, uh, if I take a rock and throw it up in the air and it goes up and then comes down, and someone says, hey, explain the observations that you just you know, witnessed. What, what, what just happened there? What is that reality? Nowadays, if people said, oh, well, the rock in the beginning wanted to get away from the earth and then it changed its mind and wanted to get closer to the ground. And that's why that happened. That would appear to us to be very primitive and unscientific. Right. That would just they would be crazy. Talk, you know, the, the rock's not a conscious entity with desires that that language just sounds silly. Don't even you shouldn't even talk like that. But yet, if you see a plane start to go up and then storm clouds, clouds form and then the plane comes back down, 
and you say, explain what you just saw, it would be perfectly sensible to say, well, originally the, the, they wanted to get to Toledo, but then the pilots saw the clouds and maybe you know the uh, air traffic control told them, actually, no, there's clouds ahead, come back down because it's too dangerous. And they, you know, they didn't want to take that risk. That is perfectly scientific, you know, scientific. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's how we talk in everyday language and that's perfectly justified, right? And so you see there's this divide there among the other differences between those two scenarios. One of the important ones is that to say the pilot has subjective desires or intentions, okay? So that notion of intentionality is key to what we're doing in praxeology. And so what Mises was arguing is that we can carve out this whole new field of scientific inquiry that we as people studying human behavior, and let's call it praxeology, and what we're studying is just the logic of that fact, that people have desires and then they use their mind to, to try to pick means to achieve those goals, okay? And so as we go on, you'll see this fleshed out more in terms of relationship to things you normally think of as economics, like prices and business cycle. That's where we're going with this whole boot camp. We're, we're building up to, so you understand the Austrian theory of the business cycle by the time this is done. But Mises, more so than most any other economist, wanted to be clear about this is the foundation of what we're doing. Let's be clear on what economics is before we just jump right into the interesting stuff. Because if you don't have a good foundation, the whole thing could crumble. Okay, let me give one more uh, clarification on what Mises means by this, this idea of action, which you might, you might call purposeful behavior. And it has to do with this word rational, all right? And so again, I'm, I'm trying to make sure you don't get confused with what other economists are doing compared to the Austrians, that uh, some economists say, oh, well, economics, it's, it's kind of assumes people are rational. Let's see how far that gets us in terms of predicting human behavior and then, you know, in the real world, people aren't totally rational, but that's a good benchmark, you know, to, to sort of give us a, a frame of reference. Again, that's not what Mises means. He, purposeful behavior means when people have a goal in mind and they choose a means to try to achieve that, whether or not their means is, is a good one, is successful. Okay, so if you see people doing a rain dance and we, with our, you know, view, perspective, think that, oh, since those people don't understand meteorology, dancing around like that, and chancering things, that's not gonna make it rain. Nonetheless, that is action, okay? Because you could say, why are they doing that? It's not just because of the, the laws of physics or chemistry or biology. We can say, oh, because it hasn't been raining, they're concerned that they're gonna lose the crop, and so that's why they're doing this ritual, because they believe, perhaps we would say erroneously, that doing that will cause it to rain, right? So they have goals in mind that they're trying to achieve, and they're using their minds, their reason, to try to achieve them, even if we happen to think that the means they're picking are not really gonna be successful in this particular example. Okay, and that's, it's important to make that distinction because otherwise you lose, the, you lose that ability to distinguish purposeful behavior from just natural reflexes. If we look back in human history, lots of humans were doing things that from our vantage point we think were unsuccessful attempts to achieve their goals, but nonetheless they were clearly engaged in purposeful behavior. You know, if you looked at what doctors were doing 200 years ago, a lot of that we would now say that wasn't a good idea or that they, they were barking up the wrong tree. But clearly, if we're trying to understand what was going on, we need to know they had goals in mind. And so you'll see if you're just wondering, well, what does this have to do with conventional economic topics? It goes back to this revolution I said in the 1870s to explain market prices, to know, you know, why do cigarettes and, to, and uh, tobacco have such a certain price, you need to know that people enjoy smoking, right? If you didn't know that, that you, this would just be a bewildering array of statistics. But once you know, oh, there are some people, they enjoy smoking cigarettes or pipes or what have you, then it all falls into place. You understand why they pay money for those things and then why ultimately it makes sense for farmers to be growing tobacco and selling that for money. And that's the causal chain of, of explanation. And so, the point is, it doesn't matter whether you, you as an analyst think smoking is good or bad for the person. The point is you need to be able to explain market prices and why does tobacco have a certain price. You need to know that there are some people who enjoy that, the, you know, the, the buzz they get from smoking a cigarette. And so they think that, OK, if I want to satisfy that, a good means of doing that is going and buying cigarettes. OK, so that's 
the idea where here you just need to be able to understand when people have goals in mind and then set out to achieve them. You study that process and one of the offshoots of that discovery or that, that study is, oh, now you can explain market prices the modern way that we've realized is a much better approach than what they used to do under Adam Smith and so on. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to uh, Roman numeral number two in your outline on method. So if I've explained to you what praxeology is and how economics is just the best developed component of this broader study of human action, what is the, is the exact method in praxeology that we use to, to advance our knowledge? So here, uh, Mises argued that, and this is where a lot of people criticized him, and I'm going to come back at the end of these remarks to address some of these criticisms, but let's first make sure we understand what Mises is, is saying. He was saying that we start with this idea that, that humans act, that people have purposeful behavior, they have intentions, desires, and then they use their minds, their reason to try to achieve their goals. And then we can, as an analyst, just step by step deduce certain implications from that. And that is, is what we're actually doing in economics. And we might supplement it with certain other things like to, to talk about the availability of labor versus land and so on. And in later lectures, people will get more specific. But Mises wants to be clear, that is what we're doing. And notice this is totally different from what they do in the natural sciences, right? In physics or chemistry or biology, we don't have any internal knowledge of what it's like to be a hydrogen atom. Right. We don't, we don't have any knowledge. Well, at least I don't. Maybe you guys do. But the point is, that's we can't just sit there and run a thought experiment and say, well, gee, if I were hydrogen added, you know, would I want to bond with oxygen or I'm not sure, you know, that you can't you can't think like that. Right. And so all that's available to you is to make testable, at least in principle, hypotheses or you know, guesses about, well, if the initial conditions were such and such you know, it would maybe it would end up looking like this, or if this theory is correct, this is what we would see in the laboratory, or if we're doing astronomy, we'd say if, you know, these are our predictions, the sky would look like this on this date, and then you can point the telescopes when that date occurs and look up at the sky and see where we write. And if we were, then you say, okay, that's, you know, that's good, that's good evidence in favor of this particular theory. The theory might still be wrong, but okay, so far it looks pretty good. Whereas you can point the telescope and the stars are totally not where you thought they were going to be, you know, okay, I don't have a good model of how the heavens work or how the, how the universe works in terms of stars and their motion. Okay, so that's what they do in the hard sciences, or what we call the hard sciences, the natural sciences. You might call them the empirical sciences. Mises is quite clear that in economics, that's not what we're doing, and it's a mistake to think that we should copy those methods to try to gain the prestige of the physicists, you know, because the, the general public really thinks the physicists are smart and that that's the model of how science ought to behave. And Mises is quite clear that, no, that's, that's a dead end. You're going to run into problems with that, that what we're doing in economics, which again is a subset of praxeology, is we are starting from the idea that in certain things of, of life, it makes great sense to interpret what's happening by saying there is another mind at work there and to see the implications of that. And then let's just study that fact. Let's follow those, um, the deduction of that to its logical conclusion. All right, so there's this term that floats around. I, I struggle with whether even to bring this up, but you might hear it if you read more. So I just want you to know what it is. The term is a priori. And the, all that means is you can have this type of knowledge without going out and looking at the outside world for empirical verification. It's stuff you can know just by thinking it through. OK, so I'm, I'm obviously not getting too philosophically savvy here. I just want you to be familiar with the, the big picture of what these terms mean. So that's one way that people describe what Mises is saying is going on in economics. OK, so let me give you just some examples of, of what I mean by this so you can understand. Uh, there's this principle in economics called diminishing marginal utility. All right. And so let me just walk you through how using this deductive method you could derive this insight, this you, know, you gain knowledge about how does economics work or you, you gain a principle in economics, right? So this idea of, it's called diminishing marginal utility. Again, in the next lecture, you're gonna learn more about these concepts, but I'm, here I'm focusing on how would we come to this new principle? How would we know it's true as an economist? How would you get it across? So what, what it means, marginal utility is saying, if I get one more unit of a good, you know, right now I have five apples, what if I get a sixth apple 
you know, how much satisfaction does that give me? How much happiness does it give me? And the idea of diminishing marginal utility is that as you get more and more units on the margin, you know, the utility from additional units is smaller. Okay, that's the idea. And so how would you go about proving that? Well, if you were st steeped in the, in the logic and the, in the methodology of chemistry and physics, you might say, oh, well, let's, let's conduct a bunch of experiments. Let's get a thousand test subjects. We'll put them into you know, a control group and a, and a, 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 a treatment group. And you know, maybe we'll do a double blind study. We won't tell them which one. We'll give some of them five apples, some of them six apples and so on. And we'll, we'll give them a survey, I guess, and ask them how much did you like that, that sixth apple. You know, so you, you run into difficulties, but the point is you, a lot of people would think that's the way you learn new knowledge about the world, right? Because that's, that's just the scientific method, isn't it? And, and the point is with this, no, that's not at all what we do. What we do in economics is we just think through the logic of the situation and say, okay, if people really value apples, if apples are a good, and that just that term, you know, to, for it to be a good means that it's something that you benefit from, that you enjoy, and say, okay, suppose you had gave someone the first apple and they had all sorts of possible uses of the apple. They could just eat it directly to satisfy their, their hunger. They could use, use it maybe in an apple pie. They could, you know, if they see some guy teaching economics on a Saturday morning, he's really boring, they could just throw the apple at him, right? There's all sorts, of, hopefully that's pretty low on your list of priorities, right? So there's all kinds of things you could do with units of apples and the point is, in principle, you know, we, we as the outside analysts don't know how you rank them. You know, some are more important to the person, some are less important. There's various things you could do technologically in your mind. You could think of things I could do with apples. And the point is, if I give you the first one and you have a hundred different things you could conceivably do with one apple, which use are you going to devote that one apple to, the first apple to? The, your most important end, the least important, the one in the middle? And so if you think through the logic of that, if you only had one apple, clearly you would devote it to satisfying the most important thing to you that you could achieve with one apple, right? And you can, if you just think through the logic of what I'm saying there, once it, it clicks with you, what do I mean by those words? It's obvious that that has to be true, right? Because if, if instead you, you know, if you, if you use it to, you plant it in your back or you gave it to your, the squirrels or something, you just threw it out there. So I want to feed the animals it wouldn't make sense to say, oh, that person really was, was starving to death and his most important use for that apple was satisfying his direct hunger, but he chose instead to renounce that and to give it to the squirrels because even though feeding the animals was much less important to him, for some reason he acted irrationally. If you start talking like that, the point is as a praxeologist, we say, no, that doesn't make any sense. By his action, he is demonstrating that for this particular person at that moment in time when he made that choice, feeding the animals was the, the most important end to him or goal to him that he satisfied with one apple. It has to be because that's what he chose to do. Okay, so you see how that logic works? And so then if I gave the person a second apple, what end is he gonna devote it to? The second most important that could be satisfied with apples and so on and so forth. And so you see the more apples we give, the person's gonna then devote them to successively less important ends and so that's the sense in which you can build up this law or principle of diminishing marginal utility. And so you can see how on the margin, when you give the person the thousandth apple, that's not a big deal to the person or if the person had to give up the thousandth apple, damn, no big deal because you've already satisfied the first 999 uses that you can make with apples, okay? And so that's, again, notice you, you wouldn't go test that. That wouldn't even make sense. Once you understand what we mean by those terms, then the result pops out. You just have to think it through. But at the same time, notice that's probably not something that would have occurred to you if I didn't go down that path, right? Or unless you've heard it before, right? The average person going through life would not all of a sudden say, well, yeah, diminishing marginal utility, obviously, and then move on. You know, that's not something that would just pop into your head. So I'm giving you real knowledge about reality or the world and how things work. I'm, give, I'm equipping you so you can better navigate through your life now that you have that principle under your belt. But the point is, how did I get that knowledge into your head? I did not show you a bunch of statistics. I didn't say, well, we ran this controlled experiment and actually 72% of the time the people did such and such with that seventh apple. That's, that would be missing the point. You would, that would be confusing you as to what it, the type of knowledge was that I was giving you. Okay, so that's just one example of the kind of thing we do. Let me give you another example 
we could, and again, in, in subsequent lectures, they might give you more specifics here, but we could derive step by step a proposition saying, if uh, the Federal Reserve pumps more dollars into the economy, prices will be higher than they otherwise would have been. Or I could say, the dollar will be weaker than it otherwise would have been if the Federal Reserve pumps more dollars into the economy. Okay, and so there, you, you, there's no way to falsify that statement, right? If suppose that the, the prices are, certain, you know, however you wanna measure them are a certain level, you have a consumer price index basket or what have you, the Federal Reserve pumps in a bunch of dollars, then you wait a month and measure prices again a month later and you look, and what if prices went down? So it looks like the dollar strengthened. You say, oh, that proposition was wrong then, huh? You say, no, we said other things equal or than they otherwise would have been, okay? So the point is, had the Federal Reserve not pumped in dollars, prices would have fallen even further, okay? And so what your, these, these principles, or if you wanna say laws of economics are giving us a technical term would be counterfactual propositions. They're showing us this is what would have happened and now this is what's gonna happen instead. So it's compared to some future possible reality. It's not compared to the present. So properly derived economic principles or propositions, they don't let us actually predict the future per se. We don't know what prices are gonna be like next week because there's all sorts of things that could change. How could we predict that stuff? Humans, they have free will. We, we don't know what they're gonna do. But the point is what we can say with certainty is whatever they're doing, if there's more dollars in the economy, then the purchasing power, power of dollars is lower than it otherwise would have been. Okay, so that's the kind of knowledge we get. And again, it's important to realize that, that it's a two-pronged thing. On the one hand, don't be misled and think that you're gonna have the kind of knowledge that lets you make predictions the way that physicists can say, if we accelerate you know, electrons around this thing or such and such, we predict these things will pop out of our observations. You know, They can make those kind of, or astronomers can say, if we point our telescope at this date at the sky, assuming there aren't clouds in the way, we're gonna see the stars in this alignment, and they can be pretty confident of those predictions. That's not what we're doing in economics. But at the same time, don't then think, okay, economics is just primitive and a waste, waste of time. No, there's lots of good information we can get from the study of economics in the proper Misesian method. But again, you, get, you can't, it's, you're not gonna get the kind of knowledge that some people think it ought to be spitting out. You're gonna get a different type of knowledge. So we can know that, oh geez, if the Federal Reserve pumps in a bunch of money, that's gonna weaken the purchasing power of the dollar. So people who are relying on pensions and whatnot are gonna be hurt by that or if, if they're dollar denominated uh, retirement plans, we can know that sort of thing. But again, we can't predict this is exactly what's gonna happen with CPI and so forth. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to Roman numeral three. If you're following along, this idea of methodological individualism. So that, again, big words, but it's a very straightforward concept. What that's saying is the Austrians their approach, the method they use, stresses individualism. But to be clear, in this context, we don't mean in a, in a political sense. We, do, we don't mean that, oh, the individual is more important than, than the collective and the rights of man and so forth. I mean, there is a lot of overlap between people who happen to be Austrian economists and have those views about the dignity of the individual and so forth. But here, we mean, strictly speaking, as a scientific discipline in economics, how are we going to proceed in Austrian economics, for sure, what we do is try to explain market aggregate events, if you will, always tracing it back to the actions of individuals. Okay, so this is, again, it's consistent with this idea of, of saying economics is a subset of the study of human action. Well, humans are individuals. It's individuals who act. All right, and so uh, just to give you an idea of the way to think about this, People a lot of times in everyday language will say things like, you know, oh, uh, in, in, in 1941, th this country bombed that country, okay? And that's, that's actually sloppy talk, right? A, a country doesn't do anything, right? There's individuals that make decisions. It's more appropriate to say the political leaders in this group decided that they would like the ramifications from pursuing this type of foreign policy. They decided to speak commands or you know, write out instructions to their subordinates. And then those military officers thought about the, the pros and cons and decided 
they wanted they, they would achieve their goals by obeying those orders and so they flew the planes they decided to press the button to drop bombs and so on right so that's actually the more correct analytically way of describing what it was that happened right so in everyday language it's not a big deal if you say you know oh the bills blew that game they missed the field goal you know fair enough. they do that a lot by the way but that's that's not a big a big deal there's no harm there but strictly speaking as social scientists we need to be clear that everything is ultimately grounded in individual action. Groups per se don't act. Now, to be clear, you're not throwing out the insights of sociology and other disciplines. So it's certainly true that uh, you know a mob mentality could take over, right? Somebody, there's a, a horrible crime was committed. A group comes together and grabs somebody and says, "This guy did it." You know, Jim saw him do it with his own eyes, and so maybe the crowd gets worked up and they they go ahead and do vigilante justice. And whereas no individual would have done that in an isolated context, that's, you know, things like that can happen. And as praxeologists, we're not, we're able to rely on that sort of insight. But again, the way you would describe that is say the individuals in the crowd decided to go along and, and say, yes, go ahead, let's do this in that context, whereas perhaps in a different context, they would have chosen differently. But again, it's not that the crowd per se does something. It's always individuals making decisions. And so this, you know, when you realize that, if you're if you're familiar with other economic schools of thought, you can see just this huge gulf between the Austrians and these other schools. If you read somebody like Paul Krugman, I don't know why you would do that, but let's say you did. He lost a bet or something. You read him all the time. How does he explain recessions? It's, oh, aggregate demand is too low, right? They just focus on these big aggregate statistics. There's not enough spending. And so therefore, such and such needs to happen, right? And so, again, that's just the furthest thing from the Austrian approach, which ultimately grounds everything back in individual action. Now, don't, be, don't misunderstand. The Austrians certainly do have the ability to explain big macro events. Indeed, that's why I think it's so crucial in these times for people to know about the Austrian school, because it's their theory of the business cycle that is, is so necessary right now. People need to know that because if it's right, that means what central banks have been doing since 2008 are setting us up for another crisis, okay? So it's really important that people are familiar with the teachings of the Austrian school. But my point is where they start, the ground floor in their explanations is not looking at what's the total money supply and what's the velocity of circulation and all these big aggregate statistics that a lot of other economists look at. No, the Austrians always start with individual action and what are the incentives facing individuals and then what makes them choose what they do to achieve their own subjective goals. Okay, let me uh, just give you one last thing here now for Roman numeral four, and then I'll have time for a few questions. The critics of praxeology, let me just pick one great example. So in, in light of what I've been saying so far, one obvious objection that, that people will bring up is they'll say, this is a completely unscientific. You guys are very dogmatic. You're telling me this a priori approach, this deductive method that you can just be sure you're right no matter what happens. You know, doesn't that make you think that you're therefore immune to correction and that if you're walking around with the wrong theory in your head, then how will you, how will you ever learn the truth? You know, should we, we empirical economists are much more scientific and humble. We make predictions, and if they're wrong, then we, we correct our theory and move on, whereas you guys are just stuck in your own little world with no connection to reality. All right, so I'm exaggerating and trying to be flamboyant here just to make sure you get the nature of that type of critique. All right, so... Very quickly, the way I would handle something like that is to say, okay, number one, we have an example where all of us concede this method of starting with axioms and then logically deducing implications from them is clearly the appropriate method, and it clearly gives us information about the real world. It's not we're just spinning our wheels and transforming definitions that are mere tautologies, okay? And that example would be geometry. You know, if you've studied that in school, the things like the Pythagorean theorem and so on, your teacher can define what a triangle is, what we mean by a straight line and an angle and so on, and then give a proposition and say, oh, here's the Pythagorean theorem, right? If, these, if you have a right triangle and such and such, then it's A squared plus B squared equals C squared, and then go through and actually prove that to you. So once you understand how that works, you now have that knowledge forever. If, you, if, the, if the proof really clicked with you and you understood the steps in the proof, you know that's true now. You don't have to go out and measure a thousand triangles that satisfy the, you know, the initial conditions and see and test, is this thing really true? 
even if it turned out that you measured a triangle and it looked like it wasn't true, you would know you, you screwed up the measurement because you have that a priori knowledge. You know, no, the Pythagorean theorem is true. I saw the proof of it. All right. And so that would just misconstrue what geometry was doing if you thought you had to go out and test stuff to see is the geometry right or not, right? The, the, the proof is correct. All right, so that's just, again, one example. And at the same time, though, it's not that we're just spinning our wheels. It's not that we're just saying, hey, a bachelor is an unmarried male, and there, therefore now you know things about the world. Whereas there you can see, well, that's kind of just a linguistic convention. That's not really telling me anything about reality. You're just telling me this is how we've decided to use these terms, okay? Whereas a Pythagorean theorem, when, you, when that clicks with you, or anything in geometry, you really feel like there's something deep going on there. And that even, you know, aliens, if they had minds that could understand the terminology, we could teach it to them and they might, you know, appreciate it. Okay. So that's whereas telling them a bachelor is an unmarried male, at best that would be giving them trivia about the way we use language. You see that? Whereas the Pythagorean theorem, you get the idea that that's something very deep and mysterious about logic or something. Okay. So that's the kind of thing that Mises thinks economics is, that you don't learn it by going out and, and measuring observable things. You think through the logical implications of certain starting points, but yet the knowledge that pops out of that process is real, relevant knowledge. You, you know something about the universe that you didn't know before. That's why we still teach geometry, right? That if you're going to have someone who builds a bridge, that person you, you hope has previously studied geometry in addition to several other things, right? And so that's, it, it does help us navigate the world, even though geometry per se and the proofs in that do not flow from you know, testable empirical observations. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody.